All right, I'm going to get started. Is it 9 30? Yeah. All right. We got a lot of people on here. That's wonderful. Woo! Hello, everybody. Good morning. Can you see my screen with the PowerPoint? All right. So I'm Dr. Kathleen Brown from the University of Utah Reading Clinic. Very happy to be with here with you here this morning. I'm gonna. I talk fast. I talk a lot. I'm gonna kind of go fast so that we can get into the meat. But um, this is an issue that's been um, just really keeping me interested now for about five years. And so I finally decided to title this phonemic awareness. Sometimes a bridge too far, because. You know how education is, right? We decide to do something, we go crazy with it for like, oh, I don't know, five, maybe sometimes 10 years, and then we abandon it. But so I remember back in the day when I was first doing PD with schools, nobody knew what phonemic awareness was. Thankfully now, a lot of people know what phonemic awareness is. And so this slide will be available to you afterward, or these slides will be available to you afterward and in fact, I'm going to have, I'll send it to Matt so it's on the website. And then I think you can, I think you, this is being recorded. So you should be able to pull this up anytime. Okay. This is just all about us, what we do at the University of Utah Reading Clinic. Next. All right. I got a, I actually have a, wow, I didn't know why I did that. I actually have a question for you. You're going to need a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper to write on because I'm going to ask you some questions that I want to engage. I want to engage you directly with this, all right? So what I want you to do is tell me the difference between the terms phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. Scratch yourself down a little, a little clue about that. What's the difference between phonological awareness and phonemic awareness? What's their relationship? What's the difference between them? Hey, Melissa Keating, nice to see you. <laughs> Okay, now I'm not going to ask, we've got too many people to do too much interaction, but here's, here's the main difference. Phonological awareness is the umbrella term, okay? Phonological awareness develops from big units of speech sounds, smaller, smaller, smaller. So you see number one here? Let me get my pointer options. See these two? These are the first types of pho phonological awareness that kids have. Like they can count syllables, butterfly. And they don't need to count. I don't know why people are asking them, how many syllables do you hear? That's stupid. They, as long as they can clap it out, that's plenty. Refrigerator. There's no need to know that there are five or six syllables or however. Rhyming is another early one. Preschoolers can do this. The next thing you can do that, that you develop as phonological awareness is onset rhyme awareness. Jot down for yourself a word and divide the onset from the rhyme. And if you don't know how to do some of this stuff, don't worry about it. It's just, it's a way to sort of ask yourself questions. For example, if I gave you the word um, start, what's the onset? Say it out loud, I can see your faces. What's the onset? <laughs> Mm -hmm, the S T st. 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 What's the what's the rhyme unit? Art. Art, right? So it's the vowel and then whatever comes afterward. That's pretty early too. Kids can develop that in preschool and kindergarten. Now here's the other key one is first consonant. So when you say to a kindergarten child or a preschool child or a first grader that's behind, how would the word is mat? I laid down on my mat. What word? Mat. What's the first thing you would write if you were going to write mat? Mm -hmm. That's first consonant awareness. These are the first things, and this one here is already deviating into the smallest unit of speech sounds. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, I hit, I hit, I hit previous develops from larger units to smaller units. That's key. Check this out. This is the rest of the development. These things all are bigger than phonemes. If you were talking about phonemes being a subcategory of phonological awareness, you were correct. Phonological awareness is your umbrella term. 
But a syllable is not a phoneme. A phoneme is the smallest speech sound. Everybody name like three phonemes for me. Go, just name them. Say them. Mm. Mm. Those are phonemes. But refrigerator, those aren't phonemes. Those are larger units, okay? So after kids can sort of pull off that first phoneme, then the next thing they move toward is being able to segment phonemes, chop them up, then being able to blend phonemes. And the very last levels of phonemic, aka and phonological awareness, are these top levels here, deleting phonemes and substituting phonemes. So deleting phonemes would be like this. The word is nest. The bird sat in its nest. Everyone please say nest. Nest. Now, take out what's left. Take out the take out from nest. Net. Yeah, net is what's left. See how hard that was? Right now we're having kindergartners do that. Okay, I'm gonna get into this in a minute. Substituting phonemes, it would be like um the word is black. Everybody say black. 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 Say black. Black. Change the b. Uh, let's see. Change the er to. Change the o to er. Black. 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 Okay. Black. That's substitution. All right. These are all at the phoneme level. But these are harder than these. They're harder to do and they develop later. All right, here we go. Okay, so I want to talk about the motivation for this study that we did this <coughs> summer. And I've got 20 years of doing professional development on phonological awareness based originally on the NRP, well, even before the NRP, based on Marilyn Adams' book that came out in 1990. So I've been doing this forever, and I really do remember the days when hardly anybody had ever heard of it. And then five years ago, we started getting these questions. Why aren't you doing uh, phonemic awareness in your intervention models? And I'm like, what? Yeah, you need to do it just on its own. And I, I'm thinking to myself, why? Now we get these questions like, why aren't you pushing phoneme deletion and substitution? Then I heard David Kilpatrick speak out here at a Decoding Dyslexia or Wasatch Reading Summit conference. I think it was about 2015. And he was pushing advanced kids doing advanced levels of deletion, of phoneme, phonemic awareness, like deletion, substitution, that LD kids should be doing, that, that uh, kids in uh, middle elementary, like second, third, fourth, fifth grade should be doing it. I'm, I, I agreed with him about everything up until that point, and I'm sitting there thinking, what, where's the research on this? So we see Hegarty and Wonders throughout U Utah. They both have lovely aspects to them. I think the text in Wonders is fabulous. I think Hegarty has some great aspects to it. Um, but what I, but I, we work in enough schools and we were seeing people doing stuff, particularly with kindergartners, that seemed too advanced for their reading abilities, which was they weren't reading yet. So I spent several weeks this summer reviewing all the research as much as I could, you know, as much as I could get to, right? All right, and so we came up with research questions. Um, would everybody please read research question number one out loud? Here we go. To, to what extent, to what extent do you possible district district provide commercial phonological materials to primary grade classrooms? Mm. That was one question we asked, okay? Number two, voices together. Are some, some commercial phonological materials in Utah School District? So we wanted to know, you know, what's out there? To me, it seemed like it was uh, wonders and Hagerty everywhere, but I wasn't sure. It was an empirical question. Um, number three, I'll read that one for you are the most widely used commercial phonological materials in Utah, kindergarten, in Utah kindergarten classrooms consistent with research consensus as defined by the NRP, National Reading Panel Report, then the NELP, National Early Literacy Project, 
and subsequent research to date. The NELP looked at preschool through grade one or two. If you've not heard of that one, it was a big effort as well. All right, so here's what we came up with. There, last year, there were 42,000 kindergarten students in Utah, 41 districts. We contacted each district. What's your core program? Do you use Hegarty? I reviewed tons of research and then compared the uh, Utah commercial materials to the major findings in the research to determine whether the, the extent of consistency. All right, so we got 31 of 41 districts reporting. Not bad for COVID, right? 41, 14 of 31 use wonders, which ends up being 52% of Utah kindergarten students. 20 of 31 use Hegarty, which ends up uh, um, being involved with 65% of Utah's kindergarten students. 84% receive one of these programs, a lot. 33% receive both, and seven we don't know about. They weren't home. I contacted them about five times and nothing. All right, here we go. Can you, you guys read this, these slides okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Matt or Kirsten, do you have any recommendations for me on the slides? Are we okay on the slides? You're doing great. It looks great. Okay, thanks Kirsten. All right, so here's, here's if you took all that research it's from about the late 70s on. And you boil it all together. I'm going to give you some of the, uh, how do I want to say this, th where there's the most consensus that, th that it's true. I'm going to give you the take it to the bank findings, OK? The first one is that phonological awareness is a linchpin for reading acquisition. You got to have it. If you don't have it, if you struggle with it, you're going to struggle learning to read. The other key point is that it's the core deficit in dyslexia. Okay, now this is key here. It's the most important, it's most important in preschool through grade one. You see where I'm going with this? Here's another key piece that so many people and so many programs leave out. The instruction should match the linguistic and print skill development of the kids. So do you remember that umbrella? Hey, do you remember how it started out here and then got the units became smaller and smaller, but it's harder at the end? <coughs> if you start down here, you've jumped the gun. Linguistic development means you refrigerator. That's a type of linguistic development. It's a type of phonological awareness development. Another type would be say nest. Now say nest without that's also a linguistic development, right? So it goes from being able to handle big units, syllables, all the way down to pulling out a tiny phoneme and then consolidating the word back together. That's linguistic, that's a, so no, phonological awareness is a type of linguistic development. So what the research says is we got to match that. We can't just willy nilly do whatever. And we also need to match their print skill development. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Here's another key finding. One to two types of phonological awareness instruction is twice as powerful than trying to do three or more. These are the effect sizes. See the Ds? That's a big deal. Please take note of that. If you're doing three or more types of phonemic aware or phonological, Leslie, is that? Oh, no, it's Angie. About time, Angie. Did you bring your tardy slip? Um, I muted you. Uh, <laughs> so notice this. This is one type of instruction. This is two types of instruction. I do not think these are significantly different. But they are definitely significantly different than doing three or more. The lag time effect sizes get even bigger. For one, for two tasks, the effect size is 1.28. That's monstrous. For one task, it's 0.55. And for three or more tasks, it's only 0.3. By lag time, I mean after they finished the, the, the study, they went back and tested kids again. So lag time, what's, tell, jot down for yourself right now, if you would, 
What is that telling you about instruction? What's that telling you about PA instruction? More isn't always better. Yeah. Right. More isn't always better. better. And in fact, when we try to cover too much, what happens to the effect? Tanks. Yeah. 0.23 is not a good effect size. 1.28 is a dang good effect size. All right, and then here's our last finding that I'm going to talk about today. Using letters with phonological and with using letters with phonemic awareness, awareness instruction. See where I'm going? I'm at the phoneme level. Using letters with phonemic awareness instruction is more powerful than not. Almost double. Wow. Brittany, are you mad yet? No. No, no, not... no. I mean, I don't mean mad. I mean like mad at the instruction. Yes. Right. I mean, absolutely. why aren't we using letters with this stuff once they get to the phoneme level? All right. These are the findings I reviewed. I looked at, oh, well, I'll show you more. Hang on. I'm getting ahead of myself. There's nothing new about that. Ah, what are you doing? There we go. Ah, all right. Let me talk. I want to talk about this linguistic and print skill development thing. This is the consensus. It's got a match. Why? This is probably the piece that I think most people struggle to wrap their heads around. Phonological awareness, including phoneme awareness, and print skills. Okay, let's talk about print skills. Finger point tracking, being able to read a few words like is, go, me, right? Cat. And being able to spell the first and last sound in words, right? If you tell a kid, you tell a kindergarten, early kindergarten kid to spell the word back. What are they likely going to write? B, maybe just B, or maybe B and C, B and K, right? First and last sound, but they miss that middle, that medial phoneme, right? Medial. Okay. Being able to do this stuff and being able to go from refrigerator all the way down to what's left when you take out from nest, these things, now here we go with some big research talk. They're reciprocally causal, mm. which means they're bi-directional. Now, if you put that into real people speak, it means one of these does not improve without reaching certain benchmarks with the other. Okay. They, they feed off each other. Kind of like, you know, if you're trying to, you know, like all of us, we're always trying to lose weight, right? You can cut your portions. You can also exercise, but doing both, they kind of feed each other. It's that kind of situation. It's a symbiotic relationship. Reciprocally causal. This word is huge. It takes a lot to find something in education research that's causal. These things are causal onto each other. For example, remember how we talked about onset rhymes? Like if you take the word start, what's the onset? Right? What's the rhyme unit? Art. Being able to do that, being able to say, what's the first sound you, if you're going to spell Matt, what's the first letter you're going to write? Mm. You can't do these if you can't, if you don't have strong alphabet skill. You can't do it. So think about what is that? I want you to just jot down for yourself. What is that telling you about doing phoneme awareness with kindergartners the first week of school? Bad idea. <clears throat> you know, people say, well, it exposes them. It's like, like how much time do you have? Because yeah. we can't afford to be expo exposing kids to stuff that isn't going to take. Because how many, well, and, and you guys all have, come from different schools, but I bet, I bet 90% of you are at Title I schools. How many of your kids in, come into kindergarten with strong alphabet skills like they know all but maybe three or four letters? Not many. Right. So, I mean, so this is a prereq. That's why I bolded it. Okay. And these are the print skills I'm talking about. Finger point reading, where is the, you know, the butterfly is pretty. 
instead of going the butterfly, right? Reading a few pre-primer words, spellings out, that's a prereq. Those are prereqs for being able to segment and blend. So if I said to you, um, the word is strike, what word? Strike. <coughs> Tap it out for me. Strike. That's segmenting. Okay, now get ready. Um, I don't know why I'm with STs today. What word am I saying? Listen. St eh -m. Stem. Okay, that's blending. Being able to segment and blend phonemes, it, there are prereqs. In other words, you can't do this if you can't track print decent, read a few preprimer words, go, is, me, my, cat, right? And be able to spell the first and last sound in words. You're barking up a tree that's not grown yet. All right, let's look at this. Here's a picture of it. And I put this in there so you could study it at a later time. But do you see, do you see that complex phoneme awareness like substitution and deletion is way down here? And it's, it's impacted by being able to decode so if you're having kids trying to delete and substitute and they can't even work across a word like map, m -ap, map, and they're still saying pan, right? <laughs> then then you're gonna hit, you're gonna miss the mark and exposure is not helping them. We'll talk in a minute about why they sound so good in the classroom, but this is a fabulous, I think, see how these arrows are going both ways? Mm -hmm. That's the reciprocal bi-directional nature of the relationship. It's a fabulous article. I've got it. If anybody wants it, ask me about it. All right, so let's look at wonders and how am I doing on time? Pretty good. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, I, I know I'm talking fast. I'm sorry about that, but you can't keep people engaged on Zoom after a while, so. Um, all right, what are they consistent with? I don't want to just get on here and say wonders and Hagerty. You know, I don't want to get on and do that because that's not accurate. Both of them have some excellent aspects. Okay, let's talk about the one of this up here in bold. You're going to see the research finding that has consensus. Um, and I'm going to evaluate each program according to those findings. So the first one is that but a phonological awareness and phoneme awareness, it, they're linchpins for reading acquisition. Both of these programs get that. They get it in spades, okay? That's why the green check is there. They prioritize it in their kindergarten scope and sequence. They both do the full range of tasks from rhyme and syllables all the way down to phonemic substitution. Like saying, um, instead of, black, put an er where the o is, brack. I'm just making stuff up. All the way from down to that hard stuff. Okay, and in fact, Wonders does an excellent job. They start with continuance rather than stops in their initial instruction. So for example, um, the sound mm, s, er, those are continuous because you can drag them out as opposed to stops, which are like Continuants are a good place to start with kindergartners because you, mm, you can drag out the sounds, right? And so Wonders does a nice job with that. The other thing they do a nice job with is they also do work on articulatory gestures, which means look at my mouth, right? Look at my mouth when I say this sound, which, which research also is very clear on is super helpful, particularly for kids who have a tough time getting it, using a mirror, watching somebody's mouth, practicing making the sound. Those are all helpful things. So very consistent there. All right, let's talk about mixed consistency. The other finding that we, I talked about being one of the hardest for people to wrap their heads around is that PA, that, I'm just gonna call it PA, PA instruction should match linguistic, in other words, its own, 
development and print skill development. Okay. Now, Hegarty does a really nice job of this, mostly. In the first 12 weeks of school, they only work on the earliest stuff. Remember the umbrella? They're only, they're, they're not messing with the phoneme level. I think it's like week, I don't know, maybe 18 or 19 before they even hit the phoneme level. So that's a good thing. They do some kooky stuff, but at least they're not doing phonemes, all right? In fact, their heaviest focus is on onsets which is really appropriate for kindergarten. Now, the last few weeks of school, oh, I have X in there. I'm supposed to lift that up. The last, mm, I want to say 10 or 12 weeks of school, they go all the way to phoneme substitution. Now, remember to do, and I keep using the same tasks. So I think over time, it'll start to, you know, really impact your your perspective on this. Be, in order to say, take out, you know, the word is nest, <coughs> take out what's left, in order to do that, you have to be reading. You can't do that if you can't read already. Jot down why. Why do you think you, why do you think you really can't do that until you can read? The word is nest. Take out what's left. What? Why do you think kids who can't read can't do that? They can't visualize. They, they can't visualize this the sound in the letter. It's not there. In order to do that, you have to have what you what you would call orthographic mappings. You have to be able to picture nest. If you can't picture the letters nest in your head, pull out and consolidate back to net. If you can't picture that, you can't do the task. So with most phonemic awareness, we don't need to picture the letters, but with our advanced skills, we do. Correct. Yeah. Well said, Angie Benson. I, I, I'm gonna stop for just a minute. Any quick questions? Feel free to jump in for just a second if you want. Uh, please go back to where I jumped on. Please no. tell me again where you said where when you were talking about the alphabet. Please tell me the correlation. You asked us a question, but in my mind, it is not clear. What, what did you say about alphabet, and what did you say about phonemic awareness? Oh, that, that alphabet, alphabet, strong alphabet skills are a prereq for even onset rhyme development. Okay. Yeah. Anybody so else? The name, the sound of the <laughs> alphabet is a key to phonemic yeah. awareness. Yep, and if you don't, and we're going to get into that even more, but if you don't have that, you're screwed. You can't do, you, I'll, t I'll give you a stat in a minute on that. All right, here's, so here's a little, here, now here's wonders. Mixed consistency. Hmm, should say mixed consistency, not mixed inconsistency. Well, I guess it goes either way. It's, <laughs> it needs to match linguistic and print skills, okay? One, let's talk about wonders. Wonders, week one, day two of kindergarten, gives, gives kid, works with syllables, gets a nice green check, all the way to medial phonemes. Week one, day two. Okay, I'm gonna switch, well, I'll do that at the end. I'll sh I showed some people when they jumped on the, the chart I developed to, to analyze all this. I went week, day by day, week by week, all the way through Wonders and all the way through Hegarty because I wanted to see exactly what they were doing. Medial phonemes, and I'll show you the task in a minute. The heaviest focus for Wonders all the way through is phonemic blending. And we're talking kindergarten here. It's one of the hardest skills. All right, here's a classic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pretend I'm the um, I'm the wonders tech thing or whatever, okay? Click on the big picture and what, what is that? Say the name of that picture. Um, oh. Okay, now click on each picture and say the name. Fan. Fan. Flower. That's a pot. Pot. What, and this girl is going to? Mix. Okay. Mix. 
Apple has the sound ah at the beginning. The word bat has the sound ah in the middle. Click on the picture that has the sound ah in the middle. The middle. Bam. Okay. Now think for a second. What do you have? What is a what does a kid have to do to get that right? They have to be able to segment the sounds. You'd have to be able to say, okay, ah, this one's got ah, this one's got ah, and this one's got mm, eh, oh, I want this one. That's what you have to be able to do. But Kids the vowel who, is the very last, don't we start with the beginning and then go to the end and then the vowel sound is a very advanced skill? This is from the second day in Wonders in kindergarten. So, holy crap. Yes. See, week one, day two, yeah. medial phonemes. Now there's other stuff in there. Remember, they're doing syllables. However, we have to be smart enough to know that this skill needs to come later. That's right. So here's my point. Kids who can't read at all yet can't do this task. So what, now, this is my favorite part of the day of this talk. Why do they all seem to get the right answers when they stand up and they're doing this stuff? And, you know, why do they, how do they get the right answers? And a lot of them do it, except, you know, Spike and Petunia, they're off. You know, they're, they're, a, they're a mess anyway. They never answer anything right. They're under the desk. But how come so many of them get these answers right? Haggerty, they're all up there and they're saying stuff and chopping and doing stuff. Kathleen's up in the night, right? Because they all seem to do fine. <laughs> Any they're really good that? imitators. <laughs> What's that? I said they're really good imitators. They follow along with the crowd. Shelly, I love you. You're always smart. <laughs> Here's the deal. When it's whole class or even small group, aren't they really good at hitchhiking, copycatting, hitchhiking on their friends' voices? So when it's a whole group, if you, if you really watch this, what you'll see is you'll see the kids who are already reading, the top kids in the class will say the answer, and then everybody echoes them. And then you say, well, wouldn't that be good though? Not if they don't know what they're doing. You can't, you can't predict learning based on that, or at least there are no studies that show it. Okay. Um, hey, by the I think ahead. too, sorry. Um, I've been in and I've observed teachers doing like Hegarty lessons. Oh, hey Ash. These, oh, hey, <laughs> these teachers say, you know, like, oh, but my kids can do this. My kids get this. But as an observer who's not having to do the lesson and read the manual and worry about the behavior and stuff, I can see the kids that aren't getting it, whereas maybe she can't see the kids that aren't getting it either. So I think you have to remember, too, that when you are, um, when you're doing the lesson yourself, it's hard to really pinpoint those kids who really aren't getting it. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's harder to see them. Yeah, and the kids who are just hitchhiking. And believe me, if you're in a Title I school and this is day two, I can tell you that most, most, most kindergarten kids in a day two in a Title I school cannot do this task. There is no way, independently. They could cheat, but then they haven't done the task. This is, this is what, all over in the literature. All right. All right, here we go. I told you I'd give you a stat. I have a question. I'm sorry. Can I? Um, so, hi, Eileen. Hi. What's you might be getting that? to this. I'm at the McGillis School. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, so, I have a question. So, you're saying that the phonemic instru awareness instruction should match the literacy, linguistic, and um, skills. print skills. Yeah. So, that makes sense to me. Is there a rule about which should lead? Like, no. No. Like, no. no. Okay, so if the kid is ready to start segmenting, then, and you're teaching them segmenting, then you can at the same time introduce a phonemic uh, awareness activity that segments. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. At, at a certain point, the print and the sound combine, and then there's no real reason to do, just do sound. Okay. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Kids who don't have strong control of at least 45 letter names 
can't even split, split onsets from rhymes. This is a study, 1994, it's kindergarten kids, kindergarten and first graders, the kids who did not have strong alphabet skill could not pull s off of same, could not pull p off of pad. They couldn't even pull off the onsets. Hey, are you talking about 45 letter names as in um, like yeah. capitals versus lowercase or in a certain amount of time? Capital, and it's not a fluency drill. It's just, no, that's a great question, Ash. Um, you know, we've got what, 52 letters? For, you got to know 45 to be able to do that, uppercase and lowercase. All right. Uh, so my point there is, if I were going to sum up, Haggerty does a nice job of starting out where kindergarten should start out with sort of the, bi the bigger units of phonological awareness. They don't go to the phoneme level for a long time. Uh, but then they do go there, and we'll talk about why everybody wants to go there in kindergarten. Um, wonders, wonders gives them everything all at once, from syllable to phoneme, medial phoneme isolation. Kind of like drinking from a fire hose if you do wonders. In their, oral, in their oral language component, that's where they do the lower levels of phonological awareness, but then they also have a separate independent phonemic level right from the very first day. Well, they don't, week zero, they don't do anything, but unit one, week one, day one, it starts at the phoneme level. And that activity I showed you is on day two. Okay, so they're not consistent with the research in that respect. All right, here's another piece. Um, PA instruction that focuses on one to two skills total is twice as powerful. Remember we talked about that? One and two is better than three or more. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's, when people did these studies, they would do everything from like two weeks of intervention, not intervention, two weeks of treatment to weeks and weeks of treatment. So it's, there's a lot of, you know, good variables there. Wonders does 4.8 different skills every week, usually one to two different skills a day. 4.8 skills a week. Week one, they did nine different skills. Week 19, middle of year, 19, they've done 19 different skills. Week 30, there's been 21 different skills introduced. Kindergarten, in kindergarten. Remember, this is all kindergarten. Um, here's Hegarty, same thing. Okay, they do 10 different skills every week. Week one does 10 different skills. By week 18, they've done 20. And by week 33, they've introduced 25 different phonological awareness skills, all the way to the phoneme substitution level. I got an email from Nikki Baker. Are you on there? I got an email from somebody the other day and she said, I like Hagerty, but she, what she said, I feel, I feel like I'm on a runaway train. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the page of Hagerty, it's a lot. I mean, how do, how do you do all that? I'm not sure they expect you to, but you know, the thing is with some teachers, you give them something to do and they're going to do it all. All right. I thought this was pretty important important because we have a lot of quite a few 33 percent of kindergartners in utah get both Haggerty and wonders during week one of school kindergartners and districts where they're using both were asked to execute 15 different pa tasks at various levels of complexity remember what the research said one to two is twice as powerful we're going to do 15 in the first week All right, here's the last um, research finding I'm gonna focus on. PA instruction that uses letters is much more powerful than PA instruction that doesn't. Neither of them do well here. Hegarty, they don't use any letters. Wonders, there's no letters. What Wonders does well is it matches the P, it matches a lot of what's in the PA instruction to the phonics. 
So that's excellent. But at a certain point, my question would be, if they're doing it in phonics, which helps you with the letters, why continue with oral only PA tasks? And that's one of my take home messages for you guys today is once kids can use letters to blend and segment, why bother doing it without letters? There's no research to suggest that you should because the research suggests using letters is more powerful than PA instruction that doesn't. If you remember the, the effect sizes, I'm gonna go back to this because it's, I, you know, it's, uh, I don't know how to do this. Oh, see all slides. Here we go, here we go. Using letters, using letters, and this is on reading outcomes, okay? Spelling outcomes is almost identical. If you use letters in your PA instruction, your effect size was 0.67. This is on dozens and dozens of studies. This is from a meta-analysis. If you don't use letters, your effect size was 0.38. That's a pretty, that's significantly different. So then I would ask, once you can use letters, why would you not use them? I'll talk about why I think, because you think like, well, why are they having us do this? Yeah, I wonder too, but I have some theories. You know me, I've always got a theory, right? Here's my theory. Yeah, Ashley's laughing. <laughs> Here's my theory. I think these programs have confounded assessment with instruction. All of these tasks that you see in, definitely in wonders, most of what's in Hegarty. He, you do know that Hegarty's dead? He, he died and Hegarty's stuff is being developed by some gals that he worked with. They're like, they got their master's degree. They, they're teachers. Okay, so they've developed some tasks that I think are ranging on kooky. All right, but Wonders, Wonders doesn't have anything kooky. They have stuff that's too hard, but it's not kooky. Um, everything in Wonders has come out of an assessment that researchers used to try and test kids a, a phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, right? All right, so, and you have to do it oral only, or you've got a confound in your, in your testing, right? The assessment has to be done orally. Okay, keep this in mind. The assessment, if you're assessing a kid's PA, it's gotta be oral only. You can't have any letters. But that doesn't mean instruction can't have letters. Letters is what builds the orthographic mappings that helps them read, like in Nest, right? I mean, let's not forget that we're, the reason we're doing this is so kids read better, not so that they get to be phonologically, phonemically better aware. The goal is reading, right? Now here's the other point. Just because a task measures well, for example, phoneme substitution, oh man, it measures like gangbusters because it's hard. So it really discriminates amongst learners, students, which is what you want in a test and assessment. If you're going to norm something or you want to know like what's really good, what's okay, right? So the psychometric qualities of a, of a, of a task, phoneme substitution, deletion, awesome for assessment. But that doesn't mean it needs to be part of instruction. But what researchers did is they looked at all the original work on phonemic, phonological phonemic awareness, and they said, oh, there's, that's a task. We better put that in. Oh, that's a task. Oh, we better put that in, too. We better put that in, too. See where I'm going with this? It's kind of, I think, I thought of this yesterday. It's like parallel parking. Do you remember? I, 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 I parallel parked maybe four times in my whole life, right? But you had, a, when I was growing up, you had to pass, you had to do it to pass the test, right? Now you don't. You can say, I don't want to do that, parallel park. They don't make you. You know, and you could say, well, wasn't it good you learned to parallel park? I don't, you know, but I don't need it to drive. So I think a phoneme substitution is like parallel parking. Yeah, maybe some people can do it, but you don't need it to read. 
Any thoughts about this? We, we're doing well on time, so if anybody wants to jump in, I, Ashley, I, can, I can smell the wood burning, Ashley. Oh my gosh, All my great from okay. Cedar City. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking too, I've heard uh, the program that we use, I feel like very strong in phonemic awareness. But people who just look at it for just a minute go, there's no phonemic awareness in it. Mm -hmm. But I'm, like what you're saying here about making sure to connect it to letters, the activities that it's doing is it's like it's putting the letter M up. And it's, this is the symbol for the sound M. Mm, say it with me. M. Mm. Let's think of some other words that start with M. Mm. Does map start with M? Mm? Does bag start with M? Mm? And so you're, you're ex exercising that phonemic awareness, but you're doing it with the letters. And so people go, that's not phonemic awareness, that's phonics. But no, we're focusing on the sounds. And so I think that's another reason why maybe you're having this discrepancy is because when people look at it, if you show them a letter, they go, nope, too late, it's phonics. You didn't do enough phonemic awareness. Exactly. And this is what, this is what drove me to do this study. Remember, the research is very clear about this. Which is better, to, do, to, to develop phoneme awareness with letters or without? With letters. End of discussion. So there's no need to be pushing it as oral only once you hit the segmentation and blending stage. Well, and, and first phoneme. Once you hit the first phoneme stage, things like invented spelling, you know, or saying to a kid, spell feet. They write F. What else do you hear? Say feet. You, you know, that's developing phonemic awareness with letters, with orthographic mapping, and it doesn't have to be oral only. I'm going to keep going because there's more research about this. All right. Uh, we got that one. All right. Besides um, eschewing letters, which is not smart, both programs make PA instruction at times unnecessarily difficult. Okay, I'm going to do these tasks with you and you're going to be my kids, okay? Which word starts like itchy? Say itchy. Itchy. Add or ignore? Ignore. <laughs> it's ignore. All right, now ask, what does a kindergartner have to do to get that right? I'm going to do it again. Which word starts like itchy? Say itchy. Itchy. Add or ignore. To get that right, let's work through it together. What do you have to do? Same. You listen to itchy and you have to remember it, right? And then you have to figure out how it starts. So how does itchy start? Yeah. Then you hear two more words, add and ignore. So you have to hold them in memory and you have to compare them to what? Itchy. Which part of add and ignore? beginning first, first words. what's the Make beginning of add ah. Ah. so does that one work no no what's the beginning of ignore yeah does that work with itchy itchy you see that do you see the memory load in that task for a kindergarten a beginning kindergartner okay the, the memory load is ridiculous why are they using polysyllabic words how about itch Add and ill or something. I'm not even sure a lot of kindergartners know what ignore or mm -hmm. add mean. Right? And in that case, that's nonsense words, which is harder to remember. So it's a more it's more of a memory load. So they're on, they do a lot of good work with onset fluency, but I would not do this. I I I put in different different stimuli. Okay, here's another one. So, okay, I'm going to say some sounds. I want you to tell me what word I'm saying. Well, first, I want you to tell me this. Repeat my sounds, then tell me the word. Say it. Do the sounds. What word? It's spent. Okay, let's try another one. Here's the sounds. G, er, a, m, i, t, e. Say them. G, er, a, 
E C. E. So, E. Right? What word is that? Gravity? Did you say V in the middle? Yeah, it's gravity. Okay. So, here's my question. Why are they having kindergartners blend five phonemes in the word spent and blend seven phonemes in the word gravity across three syllables? The memory load is insane. One, what do we know about blending? In order to blend oral only phonemes, what do you have to be already doing? Everyone say reading. Reading. You have to be reading pretty well to do that because you have to go sp, eh, n, t, and you're, it helps to see the orthography to get spent, to even remember, because here's what I think happens. The smart kids in the class, when you say, say these sounds, sp, <coughs> eh, n, t, they've already pictured those sounds, they looked at the orthography and they know it's spent. And then they use the orthography to repeat. Hey, I'm interrupting Kathleen Brown because I have not seen you for a long hey. time. Hey! Oh my God! I have to say hi. Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm just trying to let Angie tell me what to do again, like usual. Uh, well, just, you know, get out of her way. It's the only way to do it. I exactly. And if you don't, <laughs> it's not good. Are you at Parowan? I'm at Parowan. I love it. Yeah. Oh, it's my favorite school. I'll sing. In 1861, a lucky <laughs> day, the Mormon pioneers came to Parowan. <laughs> You're awesome. I can't believe you. you amazing. You're amazing. So I had to say hi. My favorite, yeah, I'm glad you did. My favorite part is a lusty yeah, band of Mormon pioneers. That's yeah. it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, the Mormon mother town. That's the, where we're from. The mother we, of all songs. we never speak of it except for all the time. We're the only politically incorrect school. Bad water. Bad <laughs> water. <laughs> all right. See you, bud. Evil water, bad. bad for man. <laughs> All right. So here's what you've got to ask yourself about these tasks. Two questions. <laughs> what are the cognitive operations involved? What do you have to do in your head to do the task? And then what, and what's the memory load? And for kindergartners, let's look at wonders now. Okay, get ready. Uh, this is a phoneme categorization task. I'm gonna say three words. Tell me which one does not belong. Mop, sand, same. Mop. Mop, you want to answer? Nice job. Mop. Yeah. Okay. What are you, what's the, co what cognitive operations are and what's the memory load in that task? Mop, sand, same. You got to remember all three words and then what do you got to do with the words? You have compare, to know all the beginning sounds of all the words. You got to compare the, for the first phoneme of, of those three words. and then, and then the one that doesn't belong. Remedial sound. So confusing. It, well, it's, it's too many operations. Operations, yeah. If you're not reading, it's hard to hang on to those sounds. See, letters, makes, letters make sounds permanent and concrete. Speech sounds are abstract and ephemeral. Mm -hmm. They degrade quickly if you don't have anything to hang on to them. Are well, you and not to mention that they sound different depending on the letters that come after them. So I was thinking about that with itchy and ignore. Yeah. The way I say it before itchy is way different than the way I say it before ignore. Yeah. And, and so if you don't have anything to attach that to, those sounds aren't quite the same. And, and how many kindergartners even know what starts with means? You know, I mean, when you say what starts like itchy, I'll, they might be thinking about, oh, my nose is itchy. You know, I mean, they, they might be listening to the E part. What, that's why you should never use more than one syllable with these tasks. Using poly, you know, polysyllabic words makes it kooky. All right, how about this one? Here's phoneme isolation from Wonders. Um, 
say ah if you hear ah in the middle. Ham. Ah. Rice. Okay, yeah. What are the cognitive operations involved there? In order to figure out that ham has a and rice doesn't. Segment the whole thing and know what the, know where the a is, I guess. Yes, you've got to segment ham, which I can tell you, you can't do if you can't read. And you've got to get that middle sound, which as we all know, and I think Angie, you brought this up earlier, phoneme awareness for a, a CBC word develops First, they can attend to the initial sound. Next, they attend to the ending sound. And the medial sound is the last and hardest to develop. And so if you're right. doing, if Wonders is doing phoneme isolation, and this is, I think, in the third or fourth week of school, at the medial level, you know, so, so, uh, so guess what? Half your class, when you say rice, is saying, ah, 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 because they just think you're supposed to say ah, right? Or they're waiting to see what Jeanette does because Jeanette gets them all right. I was going to say that's an easy hitchhiking task because if you're not supposed to say anything in the middle, you just don't ever say anything. Or okay. if it doesn't say ah, like rice, it's like crickets. Yeah. Crickets are good. Yeah. And they just hitchhike. Ah, where are you? All right. So I'm looking at future research questions. This is what I think we need to find out. Once kids can write phonemes, from spoken single syllables. Like if I said the word is cup, what are you gonna, what are you gonna write for the word cup? Now if they might use a K or a C, but either way, it's it's better than writing an M, right? They know it's a K, right? Or hit. Once they can write those, once they can write those by segmenting in their head, once they can blend across words like hit. Hit. Does oral only PA instruction, you know what I'm saying, does oral only PA instruction exert a significant positive effect on reading achievement? I don't care if it makes them better at PA. I want to know if it helps reading. That has never been studied. Here's my other favorite question. To what extent do complex tasks like deletion and substitution impact normally achieving and struggling students' reading achievement. In first grade, no one studied that. They, the studies go through segmenting and blending. No studies have looked at these more complex tasks for how they affect first graders, let alone kindergarten, okay? Nobody's looked at it for grades two through six for normally achieving. Uh, oh, time, time out, time out. Nobody's looked at that for any kind of student. Even, even struggling kids, even LD kids, nobody's looked at the complex tasks. They've only looked at blending and segmenting. And what do we know about bl blending and segmenting? Is it better with letters or better without letters? Better with letters. letters. Better with letters. I think the I think our field, us teachers, would benefit from some some more work in this area. All right, this is my pièce de résistance. A lot of you have seen David Kilpatrick. He's a nice man, and I agree with him on mm, eighty percent, maybe seventy percent of what he says. But this is are some of you familiar with Tim Shanahan? This is from Tim Shanahan's blog. And when I saw this, I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna give you a minute to read it. I'm gonna start here actually. How can one disagree with such a thoughtful and reasonable argument? My position ultimately is based on the fact that there are more than 100, let's say 100, 
more than 100 studies showing the learning, be learning benefits of PA instruction in pre-K, K and grade one. And I would add with letters once they get to the phoneme level. And how many studies show its benefits in grades two and up? None. Goose egg. Zero, zip, zilch. He might be right. Perhaps there are achievement points to be found. But you won't see me touting that until someone actually proves a learning benefit for kids. Hypothesizing a benefit and proving a benefit isn't the same thing. <laughs>